12 to 15 year olds in America will be able to receive the Pfizer BioNTech jab in a major step to accelerate the nation's coronavirus vaccine rollout. The Food and Drug Administration approved the jab on Monday on an emergency use basis. It's hoped the move will allow middle school students to get vaccinated before sub September and get them back to school full time. For more on this, joining us live is Professor Jonathan Karapetis, the director of the Telethon Kids Institute. Appreciate your time, Professor. How thorough were these studies involving children and how long do you think until we see a similar tick of approval given for that age bracket here in Australia? Well, the fortunate thing, Ash, is that the um, studies in kids have, don't have to be quite as big as the studies in adults because we know so much about how this vaccine works. So this um, pivotal study that they did in 12 to 15-year-olds was a bit over 2,000, 2,200 uh, 12 to 15-year-olds, and they found that only the, the children who received the placebo vaccine got COVID. There was zero in those who got the Pfizer vaccine, 100% effective, no uh, significant safety issues, and really importantly, a very good antibody response in the blood. So um, all the right signs for this being just as effective in kids as in adults, uh, just as safe, and so that's why they've made this call. Um, obviously, they're now moving into studies in younger kids, kids under the age of 12, and so those have just kicked off and uh, they're hoping to have those results in the next couple of months. I guess to get to your question, how soon till we start rolling out vaccine in kids, particularly teenagers and then getting down younger, I think it's going to be a bit longer here. Um, and that's largely because we don't have quite the urgency as they have in the United States, in Canada and in, in Europe. We're not seeing huge numbers of cases. Um, and right now our focus is on getting vaccine to the people who are at the most risk, at the most vulnerable. And that's the obviously the elderly, the, the healthcare workers, quarantine workers, and then getting down into the adults. And in particular, it'll be critical to get to the young adults, the kind of 20 to 30 year olds, who we know are actually the major source of transmission in the community. Um, and then add to that the fact that Frankly, we don't yet have enough supplies of the Pfizer vaccine to, to even consider getting them to adolescents. The answer is we will get there. We will absolutely need to immunise our children and adolescents if we want to control this virus and can get rid of this pandemic. But I suspect it's going to be later this year or even into next year until we're ready for that. Jonathan, you mentioned that studies are underway looking at that younger age group of kids under 12. Do we know much about how younger children are likely to respond to receiving that Pfizer vaccine from, from what we know broadly about young people and vaccines? Well, the good news is that kids really respond well to vaccines. That's why we focus on young kids for most of the vaccines we deliver, really from the first couple of months of age. So there's no reason for us to believe that they're not going to respond well. It's still important for us to do the tests, um, obviously to make sure that there are no other safety issues, because as we as paediatricians always say, kids are not just young adults. They do behave differently. Their immune systems are still evolving, uh, whereas adults are pretty much set. And also, um, for, for kids, they, um, I, I guess in terms of the, the way they, they live their lives, the things they're exposed to, they've often had uh, a different number of bugs that they've been exposed to that can affect their responses. So it's important that we do the tests in kids. I've got no questions over whether or not this is likely to be just as effective in young kids and just as safe. Um, and so I'd be pretty optimistic that, that this vaccine is going to be a good one for kids. The World Health Organization overnight has classified a coronavirus variant from India as a global variant of concern. There is the suggestion it may be more transmissible than other variants. How do those variants actually emerge? Should we expect more to be found around the world? Absolutely, Ash. Um, these, so we knew right from the start that this is what viruses do. This is what a pandemic virus does. It mutates as it goes along. This is a normal part of the way viruses um, evolve. When they replicate, every time they replicate, there are some subtle changes to their, gen their genes. Um, and sometimes those subtle changes give them an advantage. In this case, with the, the B1617 variant from India, it gives an advantage in terms of being much more transmissible. That's good for the virus. It gets to transmit to other people and, uh, and increases its ability to infect a population. So we always knew that this was going to happen. What's happening now, um, predictably, is that some of these mutations are coming together and forming, uh, if you like, 
viruses that are much more likely to transmit. We don't yet know if this virus is more severe, causes more severe illness. That might be the case. We also don't really understand how much it might evade the immune response from vaccines. It's likely to do that um, in various ways, which is why the companies are now working on the next generation of vaccines. So I think it's likely that uh, most Australians will at some point in the future have to get a booster shot, not just to boost their immunity, but to also broaden the protection to, to cover these new variant strains. Dr. Jonathan Karapetis, always appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Pleasure, Ash.